Hey guys, thanks for joining us online today. We've got our own Rafe Young here today speaking about forgiveness. So I know you're going to enjoy it. If you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. Um, we're going to jump in mid-thought, um, mid-teaching in this chapter, so I'm going to set it up a little bit for you. Jesus had been teaching to the multitudes and the crowds all day like he did in his ministry, and the topic of the day was forgiveness of sins and how you treat your brothers and your sisters, your ability to forgive and walk in unity and peace when someone has sinned against you. He was telling parables and stories. The crowds and the multitudes were there. And then as the day was over, the crowds began to disperse. And then Peter came to the Lord privately as a little follow-up and had a question about that day's teaching. You ever done that before? You've been like, ooh, I need to ask a little bit more about that. Well, that's what Peter did. He said, ah, it got, got his wheels spinning a little bit. And he had some questions to ask the Lord about forgiveness and people who had wronged him. And that's where we start today in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owned him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a 100 silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown in the prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And they went and they told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Use your word to rightly divide the truth and the untruth that is in our heart and in our minds, pierce us where necessary so we can receive revelation and walk in freedom and love and victory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to talk this morning about forgiveness. Forgiveness, I can't think of a topic or a category more important when it comes to relationships and unity and walking in love with your brothers and sisters than the topic of forgiveness. Every relationship you've ever had and every one you're ever going to have will shrivel up, weaken, and die if you can't walk in forgiveness and unbitterness and releasing offenses. Husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, co-workers, neighbors, church members, it doesn't matter. Offense is coming. In fact, it's, it's really all there is when it comes to relationships. And relationships is all you got. Yeah, yeah. In these 80, 90, 100 years, if we're blessed, that you're going to walk the earth, the only thing that matters, the only thing that lasts, the only thing you are taking with you into the next life and eternity are relationships. 
Everything else decays. Everything else burns and goes away. But your relationship, most importantly, with God the Father through Christ, that's what gives us eternal life. And the rewards and the inheritance and what we shall be given to do in the ages to come are completely dependent on how we interact in our relationships in this life. Sobering thought. One to not be taken lightly. I'll just give you an example. It's even, it's even more. So your relationships, think about it. Every relationship you have, you have a certain expectation on that relationship. Name it. I have an expectation with my spouse, with my boss, with my pastor. If you've got a title, if you've got a, a relationship or a place in my life, I have put a preconceived, my brothers, my sisters, my neighbors, I have a conception or a, I have a thought, a perception of what that relationship should be like. But most of the time, the reality of that relationship doesn't line up with the expectation, right? My expectation is here. The reality of that relationship is here. And right there in the gap is where we live. And the gap is where the hurt comes and the letdown and the pain and the offense and the unforgiveness. I like to use Liz as an example. Over 20 years ago, she had an amazing expectation because she was about to get married to the man of her dreams. And she was, she was awestruck that God would send her the perfect husband and here he was here he was Woo! an expectation then we got married and moved in together and the reality didn't really line up with the expectation real quick she's like ooh he's kind of cranky in the mornings he didn't fold the towels right Every time I go in the bathroom, there's hair everywhere. The reality of what she thought it was going to be like and the expectation really wasn't there. And that's where we live. And that's where the problems begin. But Jesus said in Matthew 6 very plainly about your relationships with everyone. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other their sins... Your father will not forgive you your sins. Or how about this one in Luke chapter 6? You ever heard this verse? I love this verse, especially when I get to receive the offering. You ever heard this? Luke 38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. Who loves that verse? Man, that comes up all the time when we want to start talking about finances, right? Money, money, money. I'm going to go to Luke 6, 38. It's a guarantee. I'm going to quote it. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to believe it. But guess what? Jesus wasn't talking about money in that passage. He never mentions money or finances once in that verse. We always cut to the chase at 38, but context matters. Because the verse really starts above that in 37. Jesus says, do not judge. And you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. Aha! That makes a lot more sense now. Give what? Give up condemnation. Give what? Give up judgment. Give what? Give forgiveness. And you will receive it, pressed down, running over, shaking together in your lap. Here we are. I would say the majority of us in here, I'm, I'm going to really step out of all of us in here. We know what healthy relationships should look like. We've got it down in our spirit. We know. It's my desire. I mean, I, I love God. I, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I want to honor him. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I desire to walk that out in all of my relationships, but yet so many times my relationships are strained or I've had them fall apart in my past, and I find myself doing the exact opposite of what I mean to do with other people who matter most in my life. For the most part, we don't want to hurt people. We don't go into relationships or friendships or business partnerships thinking in the back of my mind, the first chance I'm going to get, I'm going to dog that person out. 
I'm going to let them down. I'm going to hurt them real bad. We don't do that. That's not the intent. That's not the goal. But so often it happens. It's like Paul in Romans 7. You know that passage where he's just kind of talking in circles? He's like, I know the things I should do, but that's not what I do. And the very things I shouldn't do, I find myself doing that. How many of you can relate in your relationships like that? I mean, this is the exact opposite of what I want to be doing with those who matter most to me in my life. I can't tell you how many times I've been driving home from a long day of work, rolling down the windows, putting on some peaceful music, just decompressing a little bit. I'm like, when I get home tonight... I'm going to love all my daughters. I'm gonna, it's going to be a peaceful, wonderful evening. Everything's going to be great. I, already, I, already, I can already see it. The dinner's on stove. It's almost ready. My girls are going to be on the couch just laughing with one another and having fun. It's going to be so peaceful. Expectations. <laughs> then I walk in the door and I get gut punched with the reality My expectations were up here, and the reality of what I just walked into, they weren't there. And the very things I told myself I wasn't going to do and how I wasn't going to respond, I find myself doing that. The Gallup organization took a poll a few years ago about forgiveness, and they polled Christians. 95% of all the Christians polled on forgiveness said that that was the most important thing or the top three things that they needed to walk in relationship with one another in unity and peace, 95%. But 87% of those people polled said that they had relationships in their life of unforgiveness and they didn't know how to walk it out with those closest to them. The only way we can walk in forgiveness and unity and peace with one another is that if we keep or stop keeping track of the wrongs that are done to us. You got to let go. You got to release the offenses. You have to stop counting the offenses. Stop counting and keeping track of the pain and the hurt. It's counterintuitive. It's the exact opposite of what you think it should be. That person hurt me. That person wronged me. That person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. They don't deserve my love. And if I open up to them again, they'll do the same thing to me again. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't. We have to stop counting. Back to our story. So Jesus has just met, finished the service. It was a great day at Southview. The, the church has been released. They're all walking out in the parking lots. The people are going home, trying to find, decide where they're going to go to lunch. And the disciples, they see Jesus leaving out in the parking lot like, hey, I'm going to go with him because he always buys lunch. He pays. So they're walking out, you know, and they're, they're catching up with him. And as they're walking, you know, Peter's wheels are spinning. He's, he's starting to think about the message that day. And he's like, hey, Lord, I got a question for you. So about that forgiving people who sinned against you thing. Um, How many times? How many times do I forgive them, Lord? Seven? Seven times, right? Now, we usually give Peter a hard time because impetuous Peter, he always steps out, right? And, and in Scripture is, is brutally honest. A lot of times he'll step out, and a lot of times he'll gently or not so gently be corrected. But this time, you know, I'm going to give Jesus, uh, Peter some grace. That's not bad, right? Forgiving somebody seven times really isn't that bad. I mean, think about it. What if somebody dogged you out seven times? What if they, like, hurt you? lied to you, stole from you, borrowed from you, and didn't pay them back seven times, would you just keep being like, okay, yeah, I forgive you. Good job. Yeah, hey, come on. Let's be buddies. That's not easy, right? Peter was ready to step up seven times, the same person. I'll forgive him seven times. And then Jesus looked at him and said, you know what, Peter? You're almost there. Not seven times, 77 times. But really, it wasn't even 77 times, right? 77 just kind of sounds cool. It's like, no, man, not seven, 77. You know, it just kind of flows. But what Jesus was saying that day was, Peter, stop counting. Forgiveness is limitless. Forgiveness is continuous. Forgiveness never stops. He, he, he literally opened up. He just peeled 
pulled back a little corner of heaven that day, and he let the kingdom of God just flow out. It was a new revelation. It was a new understanding on how to walk in unity and love. You don't keep track anymore. You don't keep score. You don't keep counts of wrongdoing anymore. Forgiveness is, is, is limitless. How is this possible? How do I do this, Lord? How do I go 77 times? You forgive as many times as it takes to walk in relationship. As many times as it takes. That's what the Lord's saying. Just keep letting it go and letting it go. And Jesus goes on to explain this a little deeper just to make his point in this parable. The king, who was ready to collect his debts, and he called everyone together. It's really interesting that this one guy comes before him, one of his servants, and he owes him, this passage says, 10,000 bags of gold. Now, other translations say 10,000 talents. Um, talent uh, was a unit of measurement in antiquity. A talent's pretty heavy. It actually is 34 kilograms. This is about, for, for the Americans, this is about 75 pounds in a talent. But there's 35 ounces in a kilogram. So what this guy owed his master, if you take today's value of gold, which is trading at about eight, over $1,800 an ounce, don't worry, I did the math for you. Stay with me. <laughs> this guy owed his master $23 billion dollars. Billion with a B. 10,000 talents of gold. That's not even the crazy part of the story. The crazy part is when he realized how much he owed, he actually threw himself at the king's feet and said, have mercy on me. I promise I'll pay you back. Well, that's a lie. He knew it was a lie. The king knew it was a lie. Everybody in the room knew it was a lie. $23 billion. Yeah, just let me write the check. To put in perspective, let's say you, you have an annual salary of $250,000 a year, a quarter of a million dollars. It's not a bad paycheck. If you spent every dime you made of a $250,000 salary to pay back that day, that, it would take you 92,000 years. That's the debt this servant owned as king couldn't pay it back. He knew he couldn't pay it back. The king knew he couldn't pay it back. So what did he do? Forgiven. Released. Free. Let go. Stop counting your debts. You may be on your way. So what does this dude do? He jumps up, hallelujah, walks out of the room, goes out in the street, sees somebody that owes him a hundred silver coins. Puts his hand around his neck and says, pay me back what you owe me. Now, 100 coins was about 400 denarii. It's the scripture, well, the historians tell us it's about four months wages. Let's say $20,000, $25,000 about today's standards. Dude was just forgiven $23 billion and walks out in the street and puts his hand around somebody's neck and refuses to forgive him over twenty grand. How can you do that? How can you do that? I'll tell you how. He didn't understand how much he had been forgiven. Wow. And the moment he lost track of the debt that had been forgiven him, he couldn't give that kind of release and forgiveness to his fellow brother. And he walked in angerness and bitterness. Now, I'm not trying to trivialize a $20,000 debt. How many of you would feel that if you had to write a $25,000 check today? I'd feel that. That'd hurt. But guess what? It cost you something to forgive. Forgiveness is not free. It costs something. The problem is what you and I need forgiveness from, what the debt you and I owe, we can never pay. Couldn't pay. In 92,000 years, we couldn't pay it back to God. So even though it cost something, it just didn't cost you anything. Because you couldn't pay it back. I couldn't pay it back. So God said, paid, forgiven, canceled. But it wasn't free. It wasn't free. 
It costs somebody something. It costs Jesus everything because he was the one that could pay it. Jesus didn't just teach this. He didn't just talk it. He had the opportunity to walk it. See, that's why the old covenant never worked. God gave all the laws and the rules to this people, and he just spit them out on tablets and said, here, Moses, here you go. And 634 laws later, they're spinning around, and they're just not really doing any of it. But then the word of God came in flesh, and he walked among people, and he showed them a more excellent way in perfect love and forgiveness and unity. And remember, Jesus said, forgive, and you'll be forgiving. And then one day, he had the opportunity to live that out because they nailed him to a tree on Calvary. And as he was hanging there and his life was being drained from his body and all of his offenders, all of his accusers, everyone who sinned against him was standing right before them. But guess what? He didn't look at the offenders. He didn't look at the offense. He took his eyes above them, and Scripture says he looked up at the Father, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He wasn't counting the offense. He wasn't counting the pain and the hurt and the sin. He released them in forgiveness. A lot of times I'm like, yeah, but that's Jesus, you know. <laughs> Don't ask me to be like Jesus. I mean, I know I'm supposed to, but come on. I mean, that's, who's ever going to be like that? Okay, well, how about this? In Acts chapter 6, there was a man named Stephen. Scripture says he was full of the Spirit, served the widows and the orphans. He was at church every day, breaking down, setting up, sweeping, cleaning. But guess what? He was also an anointed preacher because the passage says that the scribes and the teachers of the law, they didn't like Stephen because he was teaching the way. That's what they called it back then, the way. He was teaching the way and Jews were being converted over to Christianity and they hated him for it. So you know what they did? They started spreading lies and rumors, and they started finding false witnesses to come and tell untrue things about him. And it got so bad that they came and took him before the Sanhedrin, which was the religious court of the Jewish people today. And they said, okay, give yourself an account. And it says he was so full of the Holy Spirit that he just began to preach. And it started, he started all the way back to Abraham. And he went to Abraham and then the patriarchs and then Moses and then all the prophets. And it says he was just killing it. And at that moment, they must have been like, what's wrong with, why is everybody, this guy's good. I mean, he's telling us the history of our people. This guy's anointed. Let's give him a seat on the Sanhedrin. But then all of a sudden something happened. He turns around and he says, you wicked, stiff-necked people. You killed all the prophets who came before you, and now you've killed the anointed one. Now you've crucified the Son of God. It said they got so angry, they got so mad, they ripped their clothes, they started gnashing their teeth, they dragged him out of the city, they lined him up against the wall, they started pelting stones and boulders and rocks at him until his very life began to leave his body. Right before Stephen died, Scripture says he got up on his knees, he looked towards heaven, he said, Behold, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. Father, forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. Now, that's the only time in Scripture you will ever read that Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. Every other time it's mentioned in passage, it says that he was sitting at the right hand of the Father. But this day, Jesus stood up. This day, something happened that got his attention. When he looked down and he saw the very life of his brother Stephen, his servant Stephen, being drained for him because he was walking out forgiveness. He was not counting offenses. He was looking over the eyes of his offenders and up towards the Father, and he said, Father, forgive them. You ever had someone stand up in your presence? 
It's a, it's, a, it's a status of honor. It's a status of respect. You want to get the Lord's attention? You want to make him proud of you? You want to get him to stand up and say, that's my guy. That's my girl. Then walk in forgiveness. Release the offenses. Stop counting the wrongs that have been done to you. Oh, my goodness. Well, you just got to come back to the next service. I got about five more pages of notes. We got to stop counting. It's the only way. We got to stop keeping score. When we don't, when you don't walk in forgiveness and release that pain and that bitterness and that hurt, you look like that man with, with your, your hands around someone's neck because they owe you $20,000 and you just got forgiven $23 billion. The only way we do that is when we don't realize how much we've been forgiven. The Lord's not counting your offenses against you anymore. He stopped counting. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Let me read that again. God was reconciling the world in himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He's not counting. You're forgiven. Everything you've ever done has been forgiven and forgotten. Everything you ever will do that misses the mark and is to be considered sin, I'm not counting, says the Lord. In Jesus, in Christ, you're forgiven. And because you've been forgiven so much, you're free. You're free to forgive others the same amount. I'm going to ask uh, Donna, come up here for a second. This is going to be quick, I promise. But I want to—I want you to hear a testimony of what forgiveness really looks like. She's going to be brief and amazing. Watch this. I'm going to try to be brief. Um, when I was a young girl, um, my dad and I, we never had a relationship. And I was beat by my father from the time I was a little girl until I was 17, 18 years old. And so I held anger and bitterness and really hatred toward my dad because we never had a relationship. So um, got older and my dad moved here to Tennessee. He lived with my sister two blocks from me. And he had some things go on, um, arthritis and stuff like that, went to the hospital. They gave him an MRI for his hip. And during the MRI, he vomited and ingested, and it went into his lungs, and they gave him about six hours to live. My sister, who was the favorite of my dad, called me, and we were at the hospital, and I was sitting on one side of the bed, and my sister on the other side of the bed. My dad hooked up with all this equipment. The doctor came in, and he said, your dad can hear you. If there's anything you need to say, he can hear you. So I sat there and I looked at my sister and she was kind of new in the faith. And in my spirit, I knew that I had to forgive my dad. I just knew that I couldn't let him die without forgiving him. And God spoke to me and said, as I have forgiven you, you need to forgive your dad. And I looked at him, and I said, Dad, I know you didn't mean to hurt me. I know you love me, and I forgive you. And ever since that time, I have been able to walk in freedom. It was freedom. I was free because I forgave him as Jesus has forgiven me. So I encourage anybody, if you are walking in unforgiveness, it's hurting you. So that's it. Thank you so much, Donna. Let's stand to our feet. I want to pray as we close. I'm going to just take just a couple of minutes just to pray and just prepare. I, I really feel like there's ministry that can happen here. There's not a person in this room that, that, that any of us couldn't receive a greater revelation of forgiveness, both for yourself and sending it to others. 
so let's just take a moment. Holy Spirit, just so thankful that you're here today. Go through our hearts, the rooms of our hearts right now. And first of all, I just pray that a fresh revelation of forgiveness falls on each and every one of us today. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Somebody needs to hear that right now. Somebody is carrying a whole lot of shame. And when you hear something like this, you're like, oh, that sounds good, but I just can't let go. I can't receive this kind of forgiveness you're talking about because I can't let go. Stop counting. Receive the love of God in your life right now. You owed a debt you could never pay, and that debt has been paid on your behalf. You are free. You are free. You are forgiven. So just receive that right now. In fact, just if you can, just say, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. I don't always understand it, but I receive it. Heal me right now. Just heal me. Heal that hurt. Heal that inability to receive. Just right now, Holy Spirit, thank you. You're just, yes. And as you receive that, as you allow that to flow, there's going to be some, some faces flash in your mind. There's going to be some names of people that you maybe have not forgiven, that you're not walking in, in peace with. Release them of that debt. The same measure of forgiveness that you're receiving today, release that to them right now. And just say to them right now, I forgive you. I forgive you of that hurt. Just like Donna. Donna said, I knew I had to forgive my father. And as soon as she did, freedom and liberty and peace came into her life. That same revelation is available for you and I. Father, I thank you that you're not counting our sins against us. That you're walking in perfect unity, peace, love, and forgiveness with us every single day. And may we release that to others. May we walk in that kind of unity and love with others as we stop counting. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm sure you enjoyed the message as much as I did. And if you're not connected with the church, just visit us online and we'll get you taken care of.